Psalm 32 begins, Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. For when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. Selah. I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Selah. As we progress through our consideration this year of being made in the image of God and recreated in the image of His Son, Jesus Christ, we started out being focused on this idea of being called to holiness because our God and Creator is holy. And this past quarter focusing on the fact that we are to to love as we have been loved, which means we love unconditionally, we love first. And now, beginning this quarter, focusing on while we'll be including some uh, various topics within that umbrella, looking at the fact that we are to forgive as we have been forgiven. Our key texts over the, the next quarter will come out of Ephesians chapter 4 and Colossians chapter 3. Ephesians 4.32 says, and, and both of these are within the context of describing the new life, the new self, the new identity that we have in Jesus Christ. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as uh, God in Christ forgave you. As God in Christ forgave you, so you forgive one another. And then Colossians 3, 12 through 14, put on then, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, put on compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. And if anyone has a complaint against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, so also you must forgive. As the Lord has forgiven you. We're going to spend a lot of focus on this call, this burden, this responsibility, uh, this compulsion that we are to have as forgiven people to extend that forgiveness to others, people uh, people with whom uh, forgiveness comes easily, Those that love us, those who are patient with us, those who are kind to us, those who are are closest to us, offering forgiveness to them, but also offering forgiveness to those who don't love us, who may expressly hate us, who on a regular basis are extremely unkind and impatient with us. But before we can examine how we are to pass that on and pay that forward to other people, We have to acknowledge the gravity of what we have received. The forgiveness in Christ that is the good news of the gospel that drives away the darkness of the bad news that's in Scripture. And we all know what the bad news is. The bad news is sin, and the worst news is that sin affects us all. At some time or another, when we reach that age of moral understanding, that age of ethical Uh, accountability whenever that comes and it comes at different times with different people our hearts develop differently that our hearts mature differently our understanding deepens differently but at some point we come to that realization you know I have stepped beyond the parameters of God's will for my life I've done something that he didn't want me to do I have failed to do something that he wanted me to do, and this affects us all without exception. Some familiar passages, Romans 3, 23, we've all sinned, and we all fall short of the glory of God. And Paul's quotation of that in Romans 3 comes from Psalm 14. And he quotes this again in uh, Romans 3, 10, that there is none righteous, not even one. There's no one who does good. In fact, when a man comes to Jesus questioning him, uh, teacher, what good thing shall I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus says, why are you asking me about what's good? There's only one who is good. Is it because you understand who I am that you call me good teacher? But when, when it comes to goodness, we have to acknowledge that there is only one in Father, Son, and Holy Spirit who is good. Any righteousness we have, any goodness we have has been credited to us. 
it has been applied to us by the righteousness of God. Um, the consequences then, the end result, the payday is spiritual death, the severing of the intimate relationship with the God who created us in his image, as Romans 6.23 succinctly puts it, uh, the wages, the end, the consequence of sin is death separation from God, the one who created us in his image for fellowship and unity and an eternity together, that now has been severed. The, the basic word, Greek word anyway, for sin, hamartia just means from a, an archery context to miss the target, to miss the mark. And we've all done that. Uh, we, as the British would say, we've blotted our copybook at some point or another. And most of us have blotted it over and over and over again and failing to live up to God's call in our lives. So we're in this together and we have absolutely nothing to offer to God to make things right. And if it sounds bad, it is. Uh, it, it definitely is. It's devastating, it's overwhelming, it's impossible. This problem of sin is insurmountable from a human standpoint. And we'll explore that a little more deeply when we consider exactly what this debt is that we have been relieved of and redeemed from. I mentioned to you before that, that the best person I've ever known was my father's mother, uh, Luetta Sanders Piles, who was blessed to be among us for 101 years until she passed away eight and a half years ago. For the last eight and a half years, as we count it, I don't think she's aware of how much time has passed. She's just been enjoying the glory of God and the presence of Jesus Christ and the fellowship of, of the Holy Spirit with everybody else uh, who has be, been redeemed by God. <clears throat> but as wonderful as, as she was, she's not where she is right now because she deserves to be there. And she would be the first to tell you that. I know she had some faults. I don't know what they were. I never saw them. Uh, she was human, I am assured. So I, I know she had them. I know she needed the blood of Christ just as much as any of us need the blood of Christ. If, if, Luanda, if, if Luetta Sanders Piles uh, di didn't earn her, her salvation, then, then nobody else can either. Uh, it was only because of God's grace, through his mercy, in his son, Jesus Christ, that she came to be redeemed from sin. So the bad news is answered with the good news of the gospel. And that's the announcement to the shepherds. Behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all the people. For today in the city of David, there has been born for you a Savior who is Christ the Lord, a rescuer, a redeemer, a deliverer from your problem of sin. In our discussion of loving as we have been loved, we focused on John 3, 16 and 17. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God didn't send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He sent his son into a condemned world. So Joseph is told by the angel in the dream in Matthew 1, 21, you name him Jesus. You name him, you give him the name that means salvation. Give him the name that means God saves. Salvation is of the Lord. You name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. So when we hear that message, when we hear that gospel, when we accept that good news of the message of salvation in Christ alone, and when we accept that message and gift and receive it by faith, a faith that's an actualized faith that demonstrates itself in repentance and a, and a verbalized faith that freely and openly and, and boldly confesses Jesus Christ as, as the Son of God and a dramatized faith, a reenacted faith in which we participate in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ in baptism for the forgiveness forgiveness of our sins, to receive the indwelling gift of the Holy Spirit, to be added to God's family. When that happens, we're brought from the depths of sin to the mountaintop of salvation. We've seen on numerous occasions before this powerful text from Ephesians chapter 2, beginning in verse 1 down through verse 5. You were dead in the, tres, uh, in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, that's still at work among them, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind, but God. 
but God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which He has loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, He made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. In 1 Corinthians uh, 6, 9 through 11, we won't take the time to turn there, uh, be, but He gives us this litany of things that will keep us separated from God, keep us outside the, the kingdom of God. And after describing all of these things that many people are, He reminds us that in one shape, form, or fashion, in one way or another, such were you. Such were some of you, but you were washed you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the spirit of our God. What you were, what you are now, the before, the after, sin and salvation, only made possible by God's grace and his mercy through his son, Jesus Christ. And this salvation, this forgiveness is something that we are so blessed to, to share in, to have so graciously received from God. Uh, it's been a couple, two and a half months now, I guess, since Dad passed away, and two or three weeks after the, the funeral, I went back to Louisiana, where he had been living near my sister's, uh, to help her just go through the last of, of Dad's things, tie up some business affairs, sign some paperwork, that, that sort of thing. And among the things that I brought back with me, I told her I was just borrowing them. When they come for Hannah's wedding, I told them they can take them back to Louisiana. But uh, they were all the old yearbooks. Uh, Dad's yearbooks, Mom's yearbooks from high school, from Damascus High School in rural, rural, rural South Georgia. Um, nobody knew where Damascus was, but they had a high school. Uh, and then Dad's high school annuals from Beach Hill High School in Giles County, Tennessee, and both of their college yearbooks. Uh, Mom's two years at what's now Faulkner University and Dad's four years at Lipscomb. I looked at them when I was a kid, was fascinated by them. I couldn't believe how old college students looked in, in that day. You ever look through old yearbooks? And go, they look 40 years old. When you're 10, college students look like they're, they're, they're 40. Uh, but I, I brought those back with me, and as I was going through them, I found my senior year high school yearbook, which I thought was somewhere else. And I opened it up, and nothing was written, and it was like, oh, Tim, you didn't have any friends. Um, then, I, then I realized, wait, this isn't mine. Uh, this, this was Dad's. I had been in public schools for 10 years as we moved all over creation, and then when we finally landed in Montgomery, Alabama, just before my junior year, uh, I settled down for the first time at a private school, small private school, Alabama Christian High School, ACA, uh, Alabama Christian Academy now. And dad was the principal there at the school. They both worked for the, the school. Mom was a dormitory supervisor. Dad was the principal of the high school. So I'm this PK squared. You think it's hard enough being a preacher's kid. Uh, throw on, that the, on top of that the fact that you're the principal's kid. If you can survive that, you know, you're, you're pretty well set for a lot of life's challenges. But because Dad was the principal, he had a copy of, you know, the yearbook from my, my senior year. And I was flipping through the, the senior class. It was small. I think there were only like 25 or 30 of us. But, but I saw our senior quotes. I don't know if that was the case years ago, but, but with your senior portrait, you, you could choose a quote. And mine was, they have sweated beneath the same sun, looked up in wonder at the same moon, and wept when it was all done for being done too soon. And that was from a, a, an old Neil Diamond lyric. Now, while my musical taste expanded to embrace just about every classic rock band in the 70s and 80s, I kind of started with my admiration for singer, songwriter, musicians, people who could write the music, sing the music, play the music, like you know, early Neil Diamond and James Taylor and Jackson Brown and Jimmy Buffett. And uh, ultimately, Mark Knopfler, when his uh, Dire Straits days were done. But one of uh, Diamond's early songs was this, this song entitled, Done Too Soon. And it's just this litany of names, starting with Jesus Christ. And then Fanny Bryce, Wolfie Mozart and Humphrey Bogart, Genghis Khan and on to H.G. Wells. Ho Chi Minh, Gunga Din, Henry Luce and John Wilkes Booth and Alexander's King and Graham Bell. 
Ramakrishna, Mama Whistler, Patrice Lumumba, and Russ Colombo, Carl and Chico Marx, Albert Camus, E.A. Poe, Henri Rousseau, Shalom Alekum and Carol Chessman, Alan Freed, and Buster Keaton, too. So after all these names, well, what did these names have to do with one another? And then comes the, the final uh, lines of the song. And each one there has one thing shared. They've sweated beneath the same sun, looked up in wonder at the same moon, and wept when it was all done for being done too soon. Even Jesus, as he nears the end, even knowing the outcome, weeps as the end draws near. And I don't know why that spoke to me as a senior. I was so excited to be done with high school and move on to college, but I had this foreboding sense, I guess, near the end that, wow, this is really going to be over. And it was a little sad thinking that aspects of that were going to be over. But things shared among all those people. So Adam, Eve, Noah, Abraham, Melchizedek, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, Aaron, Miriam, Joshua, Caleb, Rahab, Othniel, Shamgar, Gideon, Naomi, Ruth, Boaz, Samuel, Jesse, David, Bathsheba, Solomon, Jehoshaphat, Joash, Hezekiah, Josiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, Jeremiah, Isaiah, Amos, Micah, Jonah, Haggai, Elizabeth, Zechariah, John, Joseph, Mary, Simeon, Anna, Peter, Andrew, James, John, Matthew, Mary, Martha, Lazarus, Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Susanna, Joseph of Arimathea, Matthias, Saul, Barnabas, Philip, Stephen, John, Mark, Cornelius, Lydia, Crispus, Bill Dethridge, Gary Lynn, Lydia Lee, Feast Basajo, Angie Lynn, Brent Worden. I could just, you know, name the rest of you, most of you I could name. What do all those people share in common? We've been forgiven. I've been forgiven. All those people were forgiven on the basis of faith. Some of them before the sacrifice for their forgiveness was offered. Some of them after the sacrifice for their forgiveness was offered. But all forgiven by God's grace through faith. And in the coming weeks, we'll talk about just how much we've been forgiven and how the reception of that forgiveness commits us and compels us to forgive one another. As we close, I want to revisit briefly our, our text in Psalm 32, reading it a little out of order this time. Verses 3 and 4 first. When I kept silent when I didn't confess, when I didn't acknowledge, when I kept insisting that there was no problem, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. That's what we do when we wrestle with guilt, when we live in denial of our sin. And then comes the resolution, the resolve, to just lay it all out, Acknowledge to God what he already knows anyway. Verse 5, I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Then and only then can verse, verses 1 and 2 make any, any sense. Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity and in whose spirit there is no deceit. And that is the blessing that we have in Jesus Christ that we will continue to focus on in the weeks ahead. The song Grace, written and recorded by Paula Story, the chorus says, I ask you, how many times will you pick me up when I keep on letting you down? And each time I will fall short of your glory, how far will forgiveness abound? And you answer, my child, I love you. And as long as you're seeking my face, you'll walk in the power of my daily sufficient grace. That is a declaration of dependence. Tomorrow is Independence Day in our, in our country. Salvation only comes when we relinquish our independence when we stop clinging to it, when we realize, accept, and acknowledge that there is no salvation in trusting in myself. There's no salvation in trying to do it my way, to figure this out, to find some way out of sin. That's only in Jesus. So if you haven't done it yet, if you haven't 
verbalized that faith and actualized it and dramatized it and received God's gift of salvation through Jesus Christ. Let this be the day that you declare your dependence. Let July the 3rd forever be Dependence Day. Your dependence on grace, your dependence on God's redeeming blood and the Son, that of His Son, Jesus Christ. Let's stand and sing together.